Upon her return to Vitoy, she created the Lille suite of paintings in her now preferred format of diptychs consisting of two vertical panels. So here we've got nine, nine feet high, 13 feet across, so nine by 13. So it's a format that she liked for lots of reasons, uh, among other things because it allows her to play off circularity and rectangularity, um, play off that organic, kinds of organic form she uses with that vertical cut, uh, unity and interruption. It's a painting that I think is opulent and tough, structured and free, moving and still. So here then is that fish trapped in ice. So clearly it's indebted to Matisse's La Danse, but perhaps it's also indebted to the Cathedral of Beauvais, where Mitchell and Fourcad had stopped en route to Lille. So Joan Mitchell had always been an enthusiastic visitor to cathedrals. And in fact, she had in her possession an invitation from the French Ministry of Culture to do a stained glass window for the Cathedral of Nevers in central France. Eventually she accepted, but unfortunately that, that never happened, probably because of her illness. Uh, she loved Beauvais, which she once called that crazy late Gothic, unfinished, superb, nutty monument to God. So unfinished referring to the fact that the vaults uh, collapsed in the 13th century and were never completely rebuilt. Painting as cathedral was also a favorite Joan Mitchell metaphor, one that she used in her personal letters and conversations as early as the 1950s, and which shows up again, for instance, in a text which her companion and housemate, the composer Giselle Barreau, wrote about Mitchell's 83-84 Grand Valet suite a group of paintings ignited, in Barreau's words, into sonorous, luminous, radiating cathedrals. Now, Joan Mitchell could be very quick to bring things down to earth. What happens when you paint, an interviewer once asked her? Nothing, she characteristically answered. My hands get awful dirty. She was not a religious person. In fact, she was an atheist. She unflinchingly acknowledged our aloneness in the cosmos. Dead is dead. As Dave Hickey has pointed out, Mitchell's dying sunflowers don't swoon or wilt. They decay into weeds and sticks. In what since then was she seeking painting as cathedral? Well, a cathedral, of course, consists of stone and glass, structure and light, which could be seen as analogous to Mitchell's quest for accuracy and intensity. A cathedral is a place, a sanctuary, as painting was for her. And a cathedral is both a material and a spiritual program. Mitchell told another interviewer that spirituality is a hokey word. Yet she went on to bemoan the fact that painting had lost some of its spirituality, which is what it had once been about. Another key book for Joan Mitchell was Hugo von Hofmannsthal's fictional Lord Chandos letter, in which a certain Lord Chandos renounces writing because words have become painfully inadequate. At the same time, he's realized that, quote, 
A watering can, a harrow left standing in a field, a dog in the sun, a rundown churchyard. Any of these can become the vessel for my revelation. He continues. Once again, words desert me, for it is indeed something entirely unnamed, even barely nameable, which at such moments reveals itself to me, feeling like a vessel any casual object of my daily surroundings with an overflowing flood of higher life. Such was Joan Mitchell's experience. It's true that her sunflowers decay into weeds and sticks, but not until she has fully felt their living and their dying. Not until something entirely unnamed, even barely nameable, has filled them like a vessel with an overflowing flood of higher life. So fully, in fact, as to cause her to lose her own sense of selfhood. I become the sunflower, she said. Mitchell's own cathedral, her higher life, had nothing to do with the great beyond or with the ultimate meaning of life or death, but rather with an intensified aliveness here and now. As suggested by the title EC, here, of one of her very last paintings, done as she was dying of cancer. A cathedral requires both powerful feelings, religious feelings in the case of a Beauvais, and the desire and ability to give them material expression worthy of their significance. A stone is a stone until it becomes part of a cathedral. And then it's also something more. Similarly, E.C. springs from Mitchell's vivid awareness of the particulars of this world, which achieve their full expression, their presence, through abstract painting. In E.C., paint is emphatically paint, yet it also becomes something more the thing expressed is essentially the unexpressible. As for Mitchell's synesthesia, because synesthesia is relatively rare, it's sometimes assumed to be a higher state of consciousness. Yet to live with it every day is to take it for granted, the way we take you know, left or right handedness for granted. So I don't mean to suggest that Mitchell somehow lived in a re enchanted world only that hers was a visually and emotionally intense life experience, rife with both pleasure and pain, and that she was wise and courageous enough to privilege that experience in her art. She believed only in painting. Like music, she said, painting is beyond life and death. It is another dimension. Thank you.